Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Rebuilding Fulham, and we are nearing the end of the series. But that doesn't mean there aren't still plenty of things that can happen to shake things up between now and then. Now, today is Thursday, or well, not today, but today when you're watching this should be Thursday evening. Now, what's probably going to happen, because Football Manager comes out tomorrow in beta, in theory. So if I get my code, I will be putting some videos out on that the moment I can. Um, there are three uh, three episodes left in this series uh, due to the three months left in the season. Now, because the Swedish, uh, Sweden or Bust finished yesterday or today, I, I can't remember, um, there will be a full episode at lunchtime on Friday just to make sure that I can get it all nicely rounded up before the end of Foot 114, basically. So, without further ado, let's get going. Right, so, I've, yeah, that's right, I'm hiding the fixtures from you because it makes it slightly better if we do this. Right, so, first game of the month, oh, away at Manchester United, and United are much better this year than they have been previously. They ran us quite close to fourth place, uh, for, for second last year, but they really are pushing for the title this year, whereas no one was even coming close to Chelsea last year, and we did not deserve anything from this game. Absolutely no chance, we were just... Bonnie put them in front of the first minute. That was literally... We didn't even touch the ball before they'd scored a goal. Yanazai made it 2-0 before half-time, and Juan Mata was able to wrap up the game for them early in the second half, and nothing we could really do made any difference in that game. And it was a shame, because I we've I don't think we've ever actually won at Old Trafford or even taken a point there, but it's definitely... We even did better than that in our first season in the Premier League, so it's a little bit disappointing to see us sort of struggle and limp to a 3-0 defeat, but it's one of those things that just happens. Moving along to the next game of the month, and that was Galatasaray at home. And, well, as you can see, we are through. We did it. We have managed to reach the Champions League quarterfinals. And I would be, I would be remiss if I didn't make this the highlighted game for the episode. So that is exactly what I'm going to do. So I will see you guys in the highlights. Right then. Now, just looking at those stats, I mean, firstly, Casasola. Great to see him getting up and scoring another goal for us. But when you look at those stats, 3-0 actually looks a little bit flattering on Galatasaray. We had 26 shots, 14 of which were on target. Not only that, but we created nine clear-cut chances in this game. We absolutely thumped them. And 3-0 is a little bit light, if I'm honest. But I'll take it, because the fact is, once we got ourselves into a 3-0 advantage, uh, sorry, a 2-0 advantage, I thought, well, we probably got this tie one. So I did actually try and rest a couple of players. It made sense. However, Matroglu managed to get himself to get another goal. Which is fantastic because he's now right up on there, right up there on the scoring charts for the Champions League. And the key thing here is that our European form has been fantastic at home. And although we've not won an away game in Europe, we've drawn all of them. So we've not lost a game in Europe this season. But it seems that we can get draws away from home, or maybe take a narrow defeat, possibly in the later rounds of this competition, if we can keep going. You see Trentali de Verhena scoring the third goal here. It means that we can bring teams back here to Craven College and overturn pretty much anything you know we beat Barcelona 3-0 here we beat Shakhtar 4-1 here and Celtic was it 5-3 and now Galatasaray 3-0 so that's going to come in very very handy later on and I yeah well I've just revealed you some Premier League fixtures here but I will be showing you who we've drawn in the next round as well and believe me we are going to need those home game we're going to need that home game basically uh, we then went to Aston Villa and I was a little bit disappointed in this one because I was hoping we could have gone to Villa Park and grabbed a win. And I did say that I would have liked to have seen that. Um, Sanchez put them, to, to be fair, Sanchez put them 2-0 up inside the first 15 minutes. We had to come back, but we did it right before half time with goal, a great free kick from Trindade de Valhena. And then Costas Fortunis scoring yet another goal. Um, I'm thinking he's player of the season for me this year. There's no way. Like, Kost, Matroglu's done great. Odegaard's done well at times. Trindade de Valhena is looking great too, but I just think the Fortunus, from the amount of goals that he's netting himself from that right wing position, it's crazy. Next up, away at Wolves. Finally back on track a little bit now. A 3-0 away win, showing that we can actually win on the road, and we were absolutely dominant in this game. Tunnicliffe scored an absolute thumper, which is great, and Trindade de Valhena, literally straight from their own kickoff. Um, managed to make it 2-0, and then Kacha Niklic, not long after that, made it 3-0. I thought things were going to get seriously dangerous in terms of the number of goals, but it kind of eased off a little bit and only won 3-0. But 
good result nonetheless, and we needed to get the three points. And that was the main thing for us. It was the fact that we got the three points. Didn't really matter about the scoreline so much. We won the game. Our goal difference is pretty decent anyway, so it wasn't a sh you know it wasn't a huge deal for us. Next up, we had Sunderland, and Sunderland are just awful, just absolutely awful. And we honestly could have had any number. It was a bit like the Galatasaray game. How Emmanuel Jacarini actually ever was able to score a goal for Sunderland, I'll never know. But Odegaard's goal. Well, Fortunus with yet another goal, Petroglu grabbing another one too, starting to really take the reins on the goal scoring again from Alcasa, who is sort of forcing out the team again. And Dan Byrne, our captain, with a good header. Oh no, not a header, what am I talking about? It was a volley. He does seem to do that a few times. He gets in these wonderful positions where he can just volley it in from free kicks, those ones that are sort of outswingers. Lovely stuff. Probably could have kicked on and got more goals, but again, resting players, kind of key, because we've got some important games. Now, that's actually the last game of the month, but... I want to show you who we drew in the Champions League. As you can see, who else went through? Uh, Juventus went through on away goals against Dortmund. Arsenal are through. Mainz are out pretty heavily. 6-2 on aggregate to Real Madrid, but not really a huge surprise there. Bayern Munich are through against Barca. Atletico 4-0 over Anderlecht. Not a huge surprise there. Chelsea, well, they didn't... I mean, they actually lost at Stamford Bridge against Lyon, but they managed to turn the tide back in France and have won 3-0. Man United beat Roma 5-1 on aggregate, um, despite drawing 0-0 at home, and obviously we beat Galatasaray 5-2 on aggregate. Now, 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 let's show you who we got. We're playing Atletico Madrid. It is a very, very English and heavy quarterfinal. All four English clubs are in the quarterfinal. Man United, Chelsea, Arsenal and us, along with Bayern from Germany, Real Madrid and Atletico from Spain, and Juventus from Italy. Now, the only thing I'm a little worried about for the Atletico game is the fact that we're playing the home leg first, which means we've really got to go out there and get some goals, because I don't fancy our chances against them in Spain. And I would have much rather gone there, see what we could do in Spain, and then bring them back to the cottage and redeem ourselves if we did muck up. So, I don't know, I worry if we... The fact is, we weren't even expected to get out of the group. So to get to the quarterfinals of the Champions League in our first attempt is pretty fucking good. So we'll take it, we'll take it. Now, I'm just going to have a look at the fixtures for next month before we go and look at the stats, and I'll show you the table, of course. Now, next month, it's a relatively busy one. In fact, it's ridiculously busy. So that's going to be quite a hefty episode. We've got Manchester City at home, um, but that's on a Saturday, and we've got Atletico in the Champions League on Tuesday, so I might... I might rest a lot. I might do a full rotation and rest players for that because I think we probably are. We're not going to get any higher than fourth, and I can't see us dropping out of the top four with the way we're playing at the moment and the way teams above us, uh, below us, are just sort of taking points off of each other. So that will allow us to complete our league objective as well as give us some fresh legs for that Champions League quarterfinal to give us a really good shot at beating Atletico. So I think we're going to rest players against Manchester City, um, which is actually later today. So I'm going to be going straight off to play that game in a sec. Then see what we can do at home to Atletico. Spurs away, I just can't see us winning there. And Atletico away, I can't see us winning there either. Palace away, I'd like to think we can win there, but who knows what we, the things Palace have done to us in the past. Hull and Southampton at home, must wins. So, in terms of league form, I would take a defeat against City at this stage, and I'd probably take one against Spurs as well. So I'd be happy with the nine points from Palace, Hull and Southampton wins. That's what we need right now. That is what we need. Now, this is how the league stands at the moment. Now, as you can see, we're six points clear of Southampton, in fact, who are in fifth place and doing bloody well. However, you'll note down here that Liverpool, I don't know why, have got three games in hand on us, which means if they were to win them all, they would, of course... Uh, would they leapfrog us? No, they wouldn't leapfrog us. They'd come bloody close, though, and they would probably be our main contenders for that fifth spot, I reckon, because they do seem to be accumulating a lot of games in hand. Um, Huddersfield and Sunderland look absolutely doomed, but Palace could potentially still stay up. They just have to seem to have this weird thing over us, a bit like Villa do. Um, Chelsea, well, look at the top. We're not too far off the tile, only six points. I just think that we've got some tough games coming up, which will probably end any hope we had of winning the title. But I'm not too bothered about that. The Champions League is what I'm concentrating on at the moment. Now, we're going to just take a look at the stats for the month, because you, you'll want to see this. Fortunis is really doing well. Stecklenburg is now the overall top appearance maker, but goals? Matroglu, 16. Fortunis, 15. 15 goals from a right-wing position. 
Now, Odegaard has got 10, and he predominantly plays in our left-wing role, but not always. Um, he's played a few less games than Fortunis has. That's because, you know, we've used Kacin Niklic a few times in there. But, still pretty bloody impressive to score, to score 15 goals for, for us for that position, as well as 15 assists. So he's the second best goal scorer and the top assister, but Trindade de Vilhena has done well from that position. It's good to see assists being created through the middle as well as from out wide. Most player of the matches? Well, he's now got six. I, I can't see him not winning player of the season for us. Pass rank, hopefully Zuccolini is still the man. 84. Meh. But that, that's reasonable. It's reasonable. But Tully is actually moving along quite nicely now that he's getting more game time. Mariga's injuries have kind of hampered him a little bit on that one. Yellows, well, Zuccolini has 11 and Yulesgaard has 11. Reds, Zuccolini is... Weighing down the team with his three reds. Average rating, though, is, well, out of people that have actually played consistently for us, Tunnicliffe, I can't understand how Tunnicliffe has got such a good rating. I'm guessing it's because he's got, he takes people on, he does a couple of dribbles per game, he's puts a lot of tackles in, decent pass rating, scored a couple of goals, got a few assists, a couple of men of the match. He does have a very good average rating, and it does seem to put in a very consistent performance for us. But for me, Fortunis has to be player of the season. I mean, look at those stats. So actually, I advise you, if you're looking at, well, I mean, perhaps not now, but like maybe if he's as good as this on Foot 115, then pick up Fortunis when you can, because he looks like an he's a fantastic player. Um, in fact, I'm just going to have a look and see what stat, what kind of sort of stats we're looking at for this guy. Um, he's actually an advanced player, but he's, not, he's only three and a half star player, but my God, he knows what he's doing, right? So attack, technique 16, crossing 13, dribbling 15. He's only got 10 finishing yet has been able to score so many goals for us. Decisions, 16. Flair, 14. Off the ball, 15. He's fast. His balance isn't that great. I mean, compared to some things, it's fantastic. But agility, he's got pretty much every stat. His weakest stats are things like marking, which is not really that important for leadership. He's certainly never going to be captain. And positioning could be maybe doing with being a bit better. And his heading. Although, frankly, he's scored quite a few headed goals for us, so I really don't see the problem there. His league form, I mean, all 14, uh, sorry, 14 of his 15 goals have been in the league, so he's scoring a goal every other game for us, which is fantastic. So more of that, please. And that pretty much is that for the episode. Martin Odegaard has won yet another Young Player of the Month award, and if you look at this, five out of the eight months of Fulham players won that award. Trindade de Valhena won it twice in a row, then Casa Sola. Odegaard has now won it twice as well. We're dominating that, and hopefully we're going to get some Player of the Year awards for some of our players. But we will find out that in the next episode. If you like what you've seen, hit the like button. If you like to do more than that, hit that big old subscribe button. And until next time, guys, bye-bye.